Hello, welcome back. Thanks again for joining us. It's 27 minutes after 8 and the debate on immigration is reaching fever pitch. The comments are coming in fast and furious via Twitter. Uh, let's begin with this one. Lenoir Bokikwa saying, uh, what are the minister's views on President Uhuru Kenyatta's view of opening borders? So open borders, is that perhaps something that the minister can look into going forward? And then a number of the tweets coming in, Peter, have a lot to do with the processes and procedures of being naturalized or receiving permanent residence. We have one from Bokang, Mareka, as well as Precious. Uh, their stories vary. Bokang was saying that uh, she's been in the country uh, for seven years, she's married, etc., and yet she's just taking too long to get naturalized. <clears throat> Do excuse me, Precious, saying that 13 years in South Africa, married with three kids, but still on temporary resident permit. What will I do to get permanent residence? So perhaps what the procedures and the processes are and the usual waiting period when it comes to naturalization as well as permanent residency. Perhaps it's something that the, pre uh, the minister can allude to as well as the Lon Rabo's uh, question as to whether or not we can look into open borders. Okay, Ayanda, thank you very much indeed. So um, this is something that's been talked about quite a bit, uh, Minister. I know particularly within SADC, it's, it's something that you've been trying to accelerate a little bit more. But will we get to a point, do you think, in the future where we have a European Union type of scenario? ECOWAS is doing it, East African community is doing it. If you've got a passport in one of those countries, you can travel in the region. Are we close to that? You know, we, we do have a free movement protocol of SADC. And um, I think about five countries have assented to it. The majority of the countries have not. South Africa is one of the countries that has um, signed the, the protocol. But as I say, other countries have not. So South Africa must not be asked to open its borders alone. The responsibility to manage migration cannot be the responsibility of a single country. We have core responsibility to ensure that we, we standardize our immigration legislations and procedures. We standardize uh, our documentation and we open borders all at the same time. And we, we must, once we've all assented to the free movement protocol, we must then begin to implement it to meet its timelines. So obviously, because of the numbers of years that have lapsed since it was drafted, you would need to draft the, 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 time, the, the timetable for its full effection and uh, ensure that every country adheres to those. Once we say South Africa on its own must open the borders whilst others have closed theirs, we are going to create a, an enormous problem for South Africa as a country. And, and, and I think that that's why we are moving with caution. As it is, South Africa's borders are not closed because all we ask for is for a person to submit to us a passport of their country, a machine readable passport of their country so that we can allow you to enter the country. Most countries in Southern Africa have 90 day visa exemptions with the exception of Madagascar and the DRC. And so you, you can enter South Africa for 90 days in a calendar year without having to apply for a visa. And, and, and so to an extent we've moved a long way towards um, opening up the borders. With regard to the question of naturalization, the procedures are simple. Getting married on its own is not a requirement. It's a step towards it. We've got a lot of fraudulent marriages, of marriages of convenience that, that are not there, and that people entered into in order to access South African citizenship. That's why we changed the legislation earlier and uh, now said you must first be married for five years, after which we will come and check whether the marriage was genuine or not, and then we grant you permanent residence. After another five years of permanent residence, 
you can then apply for naturalization. It, it, it assists us as a country to avoid our, having our um, uh, um, citizenship abused and having our legislation abused in the process by people from anywhere. You, you have people who arrive in South Africa today and next week they are married. Surely to court somebody <laughs> and then fall in love. First, to see somebody you want to court can't take less than seven days. It's yeah. got to take some time. You go to a mall, you go to some club, you go there, then you, you go to church or mosque, you find somebody you like, you start courting them, and then you know all the processes. But to arrive in a country today and get married within seven days um, is, is, is just unnatural. And, and unless you had fallen in love with this person before you came to the country, in most instances, it's not the case. So we, we need to ensure that the legislation protects us and protects genuine people. Because once we allow the legislation to be undermined yeah. by the disingenuous ones, we then put at risk all the genuine immigrants in our country. And all the South Africans who fall in love with immigrants genuinely get married. And, and then they find themselves clapped together with all these disingenuous types. It, it shouldn't be. That's why the legislation is like this, and, and people must therefore bear with us. In other countries, you go to a country, you meet a lady from there, you fall in love with her, you get married, they then say, we won't grant you citizenship, take your wife and go back home. Okay. All right. Um, 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 it, 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 it is Brahm, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, you've been a bit quiet, but I know that you deal with a lot of social issues on the ground quite a bit. And, and I'm just wondering, what are the biggest concerns that a lot of the migrants have that you would like to place on record with Minister right now? in front of a live studio audience. <laughs> <laughs> if I can corner the minister in front of millions of viewers, maybe exactly. I should take advantage of this opportunity. <laughs> Look, um, Minister, uh, I think the Department of Home Affairs is in a difficult situation. They're damned if they do, they're damned if they don't. Mm. Listening to the various inputs from uh, social media and even the guests here today, it's clear that the, one of the biggest, in fact, the primary concern of immigrants appears to be naturalization, getting legally documented, having a right to work and live in South Africa, having a right to access their bank account. Uh, and the other, on the other hand, South Africa suffers with this terrible image that is a result of the actions of a minority that tarnish South Africa as being xenophobic. Uh, the interviewer here, uh, raised the fact that his middle name is Farais. Uh, but the point is, um, Zimbabweans will tell South Africans that 10 years ago you could not get into South Africa without going to the, Zimbabwean, em, the South African embassy in Zimbabwe without providing about 2,000 rands worth of traveler's checks to prove you had money for your trip and without getting a visa to get here. Uh, outside of that, you couldn't travel to South Africa. The situation has changed immensely. Zimbabweans, if they have a legal travel document, are allowed to come here for 90 days on a visitor's visa. Uh, a, a, a huge step forward, but South Africa has never been acknowledged for the good work in that change, for example. The Zimbabwean Documentation Project, or the DZP, or the DSP, it's now being called, uh, led to the documentation of a huge, huge number of undocumented Zimbabweans. Uh, when we started the organization that I've been working with, uh, the situation was eight out of ten foreign nationals you met anywhere on the street was undocumented. Now we find that eight out of ten are documented, although many of them are facing challenges with renewal and challenges with their access to banking and concerns. But the reality is the Department of Home Affairs and government have done an awful lot of good towards documenting and legalizing the stay, and, and foreign nationals want to be here. The immigrants in South Africa want to be here. So while immigrants appreciate South Africa and want to be in South Africa, 
Uh, unfortunately, we have the, the, the image projected to the continent and the world that we are an undesirable destination because of the actions of a few. Uh, so I guess my question is, Minister, uh, how uh, do you think that South Africa will get the balance right? Uh, because we, we can't succumb to pressure of anti-immigrant sentiment and xenophobia as a country. On the other hand, um, the actions that are achieved uh, go uh, unrecognized on the continent. How does South Africa reflect an on how does the department reflect an honest analysis, both of the weaknesses and the strengths, the achievements and the challenges? Thank you very much um, for, for, for those comments. I think the issues of regularization of immigrants in the country is a, a matter of great concern to us. And as I've indicated, we are addressing it, putting up more capacity uh, to, to do that. One of the things we will be doing later today is to launch a, a visa facilitation center for corporate clients. Uh, we've partnered with the Gauteng Growth and Development Agency um, to establish a visa facilitation center at the Gauteng Investment Center. So it, it's going to focus on corporate clients and their families and assist them to, to, to ensure that they can access their documents speedily. Uh, we pay particular focus on them because we understand we don't want, uh, we want businesses in South Africa to thrive. Those that have recruited skills and other investors abroad and managers must be able to thrive without interruption. And with regard to all other sectors of immigrants, we are dealing quite um, uh, seriously with issues of their regularization. We take it serious. Now, the, we will not, as I have said, we cannot um, succumb to xenophobic sentiments. As I have said, I don't believe that most South Africans are xenophobic. I think that most South Africans are not. They live well with immigrants, they've got friends, they've got relations, even personal relations, they fall in love um, with immigrants and, 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 and then that's something that should be encouraged as South Africans also fall in love in other countries with the nationals of those countries. And we need to engage more with the African continent. As the Department of Home Affairs, one of the things we are doing now is to establish a unit, an international relations unit, that's going to enable us to engage more with our neighbors in Southern Africa. Last week, Friday, I, I, I was meeting with my counterpart from Lesotho. We've uh, met with uh, the ministers of home affairs of Swaziland, of um, Zimbabwe, um, and, and we will continue to engage with, with our counterparts. I've spoken on the phone with the minister of home affairs in Mozambique. We will continue to do that on an increasing basis in order to establish more closer relations with our counterparts and share the responsibility to manage migration. Because as I have said, the management of migration must not be the responsibility of a single country. We must share that responsibility because every country mm. receives migrants and every country sends migrants. Okay, I'm gonna, I would like to ask uh, Deputy Minister Chowan to, to help me with a couple of issues and uh, if we could get a microphone to you deputy minister one of them is the unabridged certificates we've we've chatted a little bit about them um and we've got the tourism sector saying uh, with tears in my eyes please <laughs> change this because we're not going to get visitors coming to the country with this onerous additional task that uh, visitors have to and then the other thing is the biometrics where if somebody's applying for a visa, they've got to go back to their country of origin. And we've seen families split as a result of that because they've married in the meantime, they've even been children, and then they have to go back to their home countries and we don't know how long that process can be and the family is split. If I could just ask you to stand, Minister, so we can get a, a Deputy Minister, if we can get a camera to you. Well, thank you, Peter. I thought you were not going to get to me. I must just uh, <laughs> commend you for uh, giving us this uh, exposure. Mm. And we've never, I think, and I speak on behalf of all of the mm. um, officials 
of the Department of Home Affairs uh, present here today. We've never been entertained by the minister's um, vast knowledge on the issue of human mm. courtship. <laughs> uh, his expertise is truly astounding, so thank you for this opportunity. I hope his wife is watching this. <laughs> She can bear testimony. <laughs> <laughs> um, just uh, in relation to the unabridged birth certificate, let me just say what it is first. Um, it has to be distinguished uh, from the abridged birth certificate, which only contains the child's particulars. The unabridged uh, birth certificate contains the child's particulars as well as the parent's particulars. You cannot uh, ask for the consent of parents when children are traveling through our ports of entry without knowing who those parents are. And so the unabridged birth certificate becomes quite crucial uh, when traveling with children from the 1st of June. Let me just uh, contextualize and say that the application of this requirement will be for South African children who are under the age of 18, as well as foreign national children. Uh, in the event that foreign national children traveling from or to South Africa hold a visa in their passports, this document would have to be produced at the time that they apply for the visa and not necessarily at the port of entry. But those children who travel without the need of a visa, <clears throat> these would mm -hmm. be required to present such a document amongst others uh, at the port of entry. This is all part of the new regulations which the Minister spoke to uh, earlier on. Uh, I must just say that the Minister had postponed the implementation to the 1st of June this year uh, after extensive consultations with uh, the uh, different sectors in the tourism uh, industry, in particular airlines, um, and this is why these uh, uh, portions of the new regulations only come into effect on the 1st of June. Let me quickly say that those people who intend traveling from now to the f and will return perhaps after the 1st of June uh, will be exempt from these provisions because we regard that as a single journey. So the panic that we, we're seeing from members of the public who are going to mm. be traveling within the next few days but returning after the 1st of June I hope uh, uh, this announcement uh, does allay their fears. Um, insofar as biometrics are concerned, this is a very, very uh, crucial uh, change to our uh, immigration regime. Uh, Peter, you would know that in most countries, when you do uh, apply for a visa, mm -hmm. you're meant to present yourself in person and you are meant to submit your biometrics during that application process. Uh, usually, if you have any kind of criminal record, etc., your visa application will be denied. Um, and this is all South Africa is doing. South Africa is really just catching up to the world standard by implementing the requirements for biometrics. What we have heard from the tourism sector is that in countries such as India and China, uh, which are huge potential growth markets for South African tourism, um, a single embassy, being the South African embassy, um, would be impractical for people traveling from far ends of India and China. Uh, they would have to make long domestic journeys to the embassy to submit their biometrics, etc. In these countries, we have uh, opened uh, several visa facilitation centers throughout uh, uh, India, certainly, and we're in the process of rolling them out in China uh, to address uh, some of these challenges. So I hope that, that clarifies a lot of what you've asked. All right. These biometrics, do they have to go back to their home countries? Could they not do them here? Um, you've got the facilities. Some of them, as I said, have got 
wives and families here, and yet they're finding they have to leave the country, go home. Is this also in line with international norms? I think uh, the issue is not about biometrics. The issue is about changing of your status. Mm. If you come to South Africa on a visitor's visa, our regulations provide that you can't change your status to a work visa, for example, while you're in South Africa, because the checks and balances and the adjudication processes are uh, far less um, uh, probing for a visitor's visa than they are for a work mm -hmm. visa, for example. Um, so in that instance, certainly, people would have to leave and apply for the appropriate visa in their country of origin. However, if you have a work visa in South Africa and you wish to extend it, that certainly can be extended in South Africa. Okay. All right. Thank you very much indeed, Deputy Minister. Uh, at Table 14, we're talking about uh, the continent. Jean-Pierre Lukamba is uh, on Table Number 14. Um, if you could ask your question. Bonjour, bonjour, the Minister. Thank, thanks a lot because uh, there is no doubt from our community that uh, you are an African. My first question would be... I'm only, going to give you, I'm only going to give you one question because we've run out of time. So I'll be very choose quick. which one is the most valuable to you. Okay. I will ask about... Uh, is it the of a operation feel a proudly African during Africa month? Another one would be, where are you with the, the backlog of a refugee appeal board and the standing committee on refugees affair? And the last one is, what is the operation pyramid? Thanks a lot. Okay. All right. <laughs> one long question. <laughs> Section A of... So, <laughs> oh God, he's yeah, so he thought if he asks quickly, he can get the questions. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, let me answer the two questions and ask the Deputy Minister to deal with the Refugee Appeals Board. The Operation Fiela is, is, a, is a South African um, campaign, as I have explained, to root out crime, whether committed by South Africans or foreign nationals. Let me say to root out crime in South Africa, to disarm all illegally armed people in South Africa, regardless of who they are, male, female, black, white, South African, foreign nationals, it doesn't matter. And to take away unlicensed firearms from possessions of anybody in South Africa. Mm. And, 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 and that's what Operation Fiela is about. It's not directed at foreign nationals. It's not directed at South Africans. It also will assist that nobody can wield a panga in public and threaten a foreign national with that panga. And government is asked to sit back and pretend that is right. It's not. We need to disarm those people. You cannot have people moving from hostels, uh, rampaging the streets, destroying cars, threatening life, whether South Africa, of South Africans or the lives of foreign nationals. And, and government sits back and does nothing about it. So Operation Fiela is about that. It also will ensure that nobody uses crime or anything as an excuse to attack foreign nationals because government is acting on the matter. So you cannot dub it anti-African, or you cannot even call it an Africanist campaign. It's not. It's a campaign against crime. It's aimed at ensuring that we clean crime out of South Africa, and it must be ongoing. Operation Pyramid is to strengthen our border management, like all countries do. We have a lot of people who enter South Africa through, without presenting themselves at our ports of entry. They enter the country irregularly. They are without documents. They therefore have no right to be here. But there are many other challenges. You've got people who enter the country through the ports, kept in store, in store, in store ways, 
in in uh, in containers stowed in containers you know i've got a i've got a minute left to go so i, I just want a quick response from deputy minister uh, Chahan, and and hopefully um i think we kind of got the essence of what you were saying so deputy minister if you could be quite quick as well with those uh, refugee act question uh, two things yes there is a backlog uh, at the refugee appeals board um, and our primary concern there is the lack of capacity in terms of human bodies. Uh, there's also intractable legislation. We'll be uh, channeling uh, some of those amendments to the legislation through Parliament this year. But we're also dis in discussions with the UNHCR on a special backlog project uh, for the Refugee Appeals Board. Okay. 20 seconds. Migrant Awards. How can people get involved and nominate? Well... <coughs> Yeah. Do you want? Oh, uh, well, uh, nominations close uh, by the end of today, oh, um, okay. and uh, it's quite easy. People can uh, find it on uh, samigrantawards.com uh, um, and also uh, on the Department of Home Affairs uh, website. Um, uh, in the next two days, we will be announcing the uh, shortlists and uh, the awards itself take place on uh, Monday night at the Gallagher Estate. All right, fantastic. Thank you very, very much indeed. This is a kind of conversation that we could have for hours, but unfortunately we're going to have to leave it there. Honourable Minister of Home Affairs, uh, Marissa Gigaba, thank you very much indeed. Professor Farid Isak from uh, UJ, thank you so much. Um, Bram Hanikom from Pasop, Tatindar Kuru Mwang, thank you very much <laughs> indeed. <laughs> and to you at home, thank you so much indeed as we thank our audience as well here for uh, joining us and uh, uh, your tweets are very welcome. Let's go to Tsihetsi uh, to find out what kind of weather we've got in store for us today and Nyanda will also be taking us out of the program. From us here in Four Ways though, have a great day everybody. Bye bye. Uh, asante sana. That means thank you so much Peter. Well, I'm not going to be giving you the weather